September 13th, 1848 was not a good day for Phineas Gage. As blasting foreman for the railroad, he prepared each detonation by drilling a hole into a rock, then pushing gunpowder into it with a steel rod. One day while doing so, a spark was produced. Over 13 pounds and three and a half feet long, the compacting instrument was found 80 feet from Gage's body, covered in blood and brain matter. He fell to the ground, twitched for a few minutes, then stood up and returned to his hotel by carriage. For over three miles he rode upright, in spite of the massive gash extending from his jaw to the top of his head. When the doctor arrived, Gage angled his mangled skull towards the medical man and said, Here's business enough for you. Initially, the doctor did not, or could not, believe the bar had passed straight through his head. When Phineas rose, he vomited enough brain matter to fill a teacup. Perhaps he was not exaggerating. By late September, Gage was almost comatose. After an extremely gruesome surgery performed by J.M. Harlow, his situation improved. Although used in textbooks as an illustration of the functions of the frontal lobe, we now know much of the lore surrounding the accident and its aftermath is not entirely substantiated or self-consistent. Little is known about what Gage was like before the mishap. Moreover, our knowledge of the case comes largely from a single physician's report prepared shortly after Gage's convalescence. Harlow writes, A child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. Previous to his injury, although untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as a shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. No longer Gage? Is that right? Had he changed so decidedly? Gage's mother told Harlow he was very kind to his nephews and even made up stories to entertain them. Secondary sources proliferated. Some said he was hypersexual, others asexual. Some said he was quick to anger, others said he lumbered through the rest of his life like a zombie. Still others claimed he mistreated his wife and children. This one is not contradicted by other sources, only invalidated by the fact he did not have a wife or children. The descriptions of Gage from the early 20th century came from different schools of psychological thought, including defunct ones like phrenology. Each wanted to claim him as their own. Malcolm Macmillan, author of a 500-page book about the case, notes that the accounts produced during this time match up a little too precisely with what was being observed in lobotomy patients. Antonio and Hannah Damasio bolstered the view that Gage was no longer Gage and claimed damage had been done to both hemispheres. Yet later research by Peter Ratio, then a professor of neuroanatomy at Harvard and now an emergency doctor in Romania, showed the rod to not cross over the midline and damage Gage's right hemisphere. Furthermore, Gage was almost definitely speaking when the rod went through his mouth. These findings were corroborated by Van Horn. Of the millions of simulated trajectories, only a handful would not have broken his jaw or killed him immediately. After a stint with P.T. Barnum's freak show, the story becomes still stranger. Gage left for Chile to drive stagecoaches. This was rather demanding work that required considerable focus. Interestingly enough, some have suggested this task acted as a sort of rehabilitative therapy for him. Of course, no one, including Macmillan, believes the injury left Gage completely unaffected. However, it seems he was able to return to something like a normal life. A doctor who knew him during his years in South America said, he was in the enjoyment of good health, with no impairment whatever of his mental faculties. Although this is difficult to believe and impossible to prove, it seems he did not exhibit any abnormal or criminal behavior. A psychometric test would likely have shown some deficits, particularly if compared to his scores prior to the accident, but alas, we have no such information. While we know brain injuries can have a very significant impact on a modicum of mental traits, we also know the brain can change and adapt. Yes, this capacity does diminish with age, and yes, there are limitations to neuroplasticity. 
Nevertheless, it is an important and amazing property of the brain, even if it is frequently misrepresented by popular science. Maybe in this millennium, Gage's story should again be reimagined as a tale of redemption, as an illustration of the brain's remarkable powers to heal itself.